I do want to move back to Montreal. I mean, obviously we talked a little bit about Winnipeg. We've talked a little bit about what happened in the series, but you know, you covered Montreal directly against Toronto. And I, you know, I guess, you know, we can talk about the, we've broken down that Toronto series, Toronto Montreal series over and over and over again. But I would like to get your takeaways because you've got insights that we don't have. And, you know, there's, the, I think the first thing I would want to know is Montreal is into the third round in less than seven days. Uh, what is it about this team that is special? They've they found a way defensively to really frustrate their opponents and really limit their opponents in a way that whatever they do give up, Carey Price is able to stop. So, you know, a lot of people are crediting Carey Price. I don't think enough people are crediting the coaching staff. You know, I you could really see an adjustment with the way that Montreal was playing after game four when it was clear things weren't working and the Leafs were getting too many opportunities. It seemed like Montreal had their backs against the wall, and what they did is they just played even more conservatively. You know, it, it, I've compared them on one of our shows to to playing like Team Germany in in the Olympics, where you're just like you could see in the press box how the Canadians were lining all five guys up along their own blue line. It was a very, very, very conservative defensive style that they were playing. And the Leafs didn't really have an answer for that. And it really frustrated them. And it was really hard for them to break through and, and score goals. And by game seven, they just, they didn't know what to do. So, you know, I, I got to credit the coaching staff because there were a lot of people after game four, when the Habs were down three to one, that were saying, you know, do charms out of his league. And, you know, is this guy <laughs> supposed to be, a, is this, yeah. Like we were sitting in the press yep. box and, and people were like, is, like, is this guy supposed to be good? Or cause it just looks like he's got no answers for this. And then they came back. And they had they had big answers for the for the Leafs, you know. After that, you know, and you know, a lot of people that watch the Leafs a lot say that they struggle the most when they play against those really, really um, like trapping kind of shut down teams through the neutral zone. You know, and I said before the series that it all Montreal, what Montreal should do is they should go back and watch that Columbus series last year and try and play like that. And mm-hmm. uh, that's kind of what it feels like they did. Yeah. Oh yeah. no, defense, my one weakness. How did you know? But it's just like a <laughs> stifling, stifling, boring, really patient. Like Montreal was was fine to go. What was the game that they went into and it was 0-0 in the third period? Was that game five or game six? I think it was game six and then Montreal got a couple of goals and then... It was there, Yeah, there was... Yeah. Well, you know, you're in game six, your season's on the line, you're down in the series. Montreal's like, that's fine. You know, like game... <laughs> Campbell was so good. First per- Yeah, first period of game seven... Nothing happens. Like literally nothing happens. And I watched that and I was like, this is bad for Toronto. Like Montreal is fine to take a zero zero tie to the end of game seven with their season on the line. Like they they just, you know, they got a veteran team. They just they were happy to win games one nothing and the Leafs weren't able to do it. You you've seen the criticism and the fallout with the, you know, Marner and Matthews combining for a goal. Um, and specifically Mitch Marner seemed to be, you know, a bit of a target. And rightfully so in the sense that the performance wasn't there. I'm not one of those people that agrees that, that you know, we should send death threats and things like that. And we've said that multiple times on this show that people are fucking crazy. But when it comes to performance in this series, I asked the question, do you think Mitch Marner's got, got the ability to perform in the playoffs? Like, is, does his style lend itself to, a, you know, to an $11 million player who has to play big minutes and score big points for the Leafs going forward? Well, I think Kyle Dubas is right that he has done it in the past. I mean, the the, the first series against Boston, uh, I'm going to get my years wrong, 2018, Mitch Marner played really, really well. But also, I like believe... It's less competition, though. It, yeah, if I remember correctly, I believe he was on the third line, wasn't he? Was he wasn't he not still playing with Bozak and JVR? Yep. And, and the idea was Babcock had really kind of spread out. So, I, honestly, I think... I think Marner is probably taking a little bit too much heat because I think the coaching staff, the Leafs coaching staff should have adjusted earlier than they did. I think it's, it's, it's difficult to say because Matthews and Marner were so good together all season, but they weren't good together in game five, six and seven. And you have to make an adjustment. And I think if they would have had John Tavares, that they would have felt more comfortable moving Marner onto his line, given how much success those two have had together over the years without that. It just felt like they kept running out the same thing over and over again, even though it wasn't working. And and I think what they had to do is they had to get either Matthews or Marner against lesser competition. And I would have broken them up. I would have broken them up. It's is, like the Habs watched the five game series against Columbus and the Leafs didn't. <laughs> like, right. wasn't this the same problem? Yeah. Gotta hate is there guys. any internal criticism of the way Sheldon Keefe handled the series? 
I don't, I mean, there's no way they're going to let that out. Like, yeah. you, know, <laughs> you know, they're, they're not calling me to, to dump on. No, I think Kellen Keith said, yeah, <laughs> James, I'm pissed. <laughs> yeah. Kyle, call me back. There, Jesse, there, there's there's external criticism of of the way that the Leafs coached in this series and the way that they they didn't adapt. Um, it's 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 tough. I mean, I feel you know, I, I think Sheldon Keith was thinking, you know, my bench was short and I needed the big guys to get it done. And in Game Seven, he was getting them away from from Dino. He was getting them up against fourth lines and third lines and different D pairs, and he was getting them offensive zone starts. It was probably too late. They probably should have needed to make that adjustment earlier and give those guys more time. Um, mm-hmm. Game seven was just a complete disaster. I wonder if, if in the start of game six, if you started to really make the minutes a less challenging. And that that quote at the beginning of the series that that Keith wasn't oh. worried about playing Matthews and Marner against anybody was it ended up coming to bite them in a bad way. Um, and the, with the power play, you know, it seemed like I mean, I guess they made adjustments, but. It seems like they made adjustments too late all season. It struggled is, you know, there were people who I think rightfully so were highly critical of the way it was run. And, and the fact that, you know, we got a new coach behind there running things. Is there a, a potential change in system or a potential change in personnel coming? Do you think? Yeah. I mean, I think you could see both. I think that there's a lot of things on the table, like Sheldon Keefe's not going to get let go. Kyle Dubas no. is not going to let go. Brandon Shanahan staying. But like, I think that some of the supporting pieces could be certainly be different. I don't know if, I don't know how far along in that process they are at this point. It's been pretty quiet out of the out of the Maple Leafs. I think that they're what they're going to do is they're going to sit down and really kind of have a clear eyed assessment of where they need to go. But I think that I would not be surprised at all if you see different people in management, different people on the bench, different people on the coaching staff. You know, there was a lot of talk about getting Sheldon Keefe, someone with a lot of experience to really support him on the bench because they felt like after the first year, after the Columbus series, that he needed someone. You know, that's why there was all the talk about Bruce Boudreaux. And I really thought that that was going to happen or something like that was going to happen. In the end, it didn't. In the end, they they went with Manny Malhotra, who does not have a lot of experience on, on an NHL bench. Uh, they do have Dave Haxtell there, obviously, running the defense. Um, wouldn't shock me if there's a change there. Uh, they do have Paul McLean, who was kind of like the eye in the sky. I don't know how they feel about if that worked or not, but they're going to need to change some things because, you know, the power play was a disaster for 30 odd games. And and the last three games of the playoffs were a disaster too. And I'm not trying to hang it all on Sheldon Keefe. I'm just trying to say that I don't think this is all on Matthews and Marner not being able to score. I think that the Leafs really didn't adjust as a team very well. And that falls on a lot of people in the organization. What do you see cha- coming in terms of changes in player personnel this summer? Because, like, the thing is, the team's pretty strong all the way through, is it not? Yeah. Yeah. But, I mean, I think they do have to do some soul-searching on... I, I, I think, you know, in, in light of what happened at the end there, yes, they're a pretty strong team, but if you rank them in the NHL and if you watch the rest of the playoffs, are they strong enough to beat a Tampa or a Vegas or a Colorado in a playoff series? No. Pro- probably not. And... The question for me is if you keep the core four guys together, that's half your cap space. How do you get better? How do you get better if you lose Zach Hyman to free agency, which could happen? How do you get better if Morgan Riley walks in a year to free agency? What's How do you get better if like they don't really have, this probably doesn't get talked about enough, they don't really have prospects ready to step in and be difference makers right now. They don't. Like, you know, Sandine should be a full-time NHL player next year, but he's probably on the third pair. Nick Robertson was up and down in the AHL. I don't know that he's even ready to contribute to the NHL. And there's nobody else. You know, if you look at, at some of the teams that, you know, that, that, that ha- if you look back at some of the teams that spent a lot of money on, on few players, like let's say Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh spent almost 50% of their, their payroll on the, the team in 2016 that won the Cup or 2017 that won the Cup. They also had guys like Jake Gensel and some other guys that were on entry-level contracts or making hardly any money. The Leafs don't have kids like that coming right now, so they're going to have to find it another way. And some of the players they didn't spend a lot of money on last year that they were hoping could help them, like Joe Thornton, Jimmy VC, Travis Boyd, uh, Zach Bogosian was fine. Obviously, Jason Spezza had a really good year, but there were a lot of those guys that they tried to win with and spend not a lot of money on that it didn't work out. Uh, uh, Letnin, Barabanov. There's probably other other ones that I'm forgetting. There's a whole long list of them. 
they need to hit on some of those players and that they're actually making a difference on their third and fourth line and, and their third deep pair. And they haven't been able to do that nearly enough. You know what I don't like about this conversation? And we've had it with a few people now. <laughs> it reminds me a lot about uh, when the Leafs lost game seven to Boston in 2019. And the obvious choice was to fire Mike Babcock. And they decide, nope, we want to be shit for a month and a half before we make that decision. Thank you very much. And then they were. The decision seems fairly obvious the more people we speak to. They're spending too much goddamn money on four pl players. They're spending too much money on four players. But for some reason, we just got to mm, give them an, ah, oh, what's another year? It's been over 50. What's another year? Like, they're not, how, what is the percentage chance they do anything with the core four this offseason? I don't think they would have come out in those press conferences and said, we're not doing anything with the core four and then do it. I, I don't, I take them at their word. Like, I don't think they're going to come out publicly and say, we believe in this core and we're keeping it together. And I, 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 I just don't, I don't believe that they would do that. It would be, it would be really weird for them to do that. And then all of a sudden go and make a trade. But I like to add to that, Steve. I don't know why they did that. I wouldn't have done that. I mean, most teams would have just said we're going to evaluate everything, and we'll see. You know, maybe they're trying to calm the waters, and they're trying to. Uh. So you you really you don't think, Steve? There's any way that you can win with with those four guys eating up that percentage of your payroll? There's no way to. I mean, it, I mean, it would help if Tavares had been there, right? I mean, that, right. The, well, that's the, the thing. I mean, you're, we don't, don't know. We just don't Muzzin, know. Muzzin's missing and yeah. Felino isn't giving you anything. And I mean, but, injuries happen, but we have to take injuries into context. Like the thing is, is that when, when, when you, when you have put so much of your payroll in four guys, you're more vulnerable to injuries because if we've yes. seen that in the past, like during the regular season, yes. like when Matthews has been hurt, it's like, holy crap. Like they don't have, they don't have enough when one of those guys goes down. So Hockey just, it's, it's a sport. Not personal. It's, <laughs> it's not personal. It's numbers. It's math. But I think then the question becomes, okay, let's, let's, let's say, let's say they do theoretically want to trade one of the core four. You're not going to trade Tavares. He's got the no movement clause. He's not going to agree to waive it. He's your captain, mm -hmm. et cetera. Matthews, you don't, you don't want to trade him. Nylander, like, are you going to, is there a trade you can make with Nylander where you, it's going to make your team better? The, the, you know what's the tough. crazy thing? The, the thing this year is that the defense was not a problem. Goaltending was not a problem. Right. And they st and they still lost. I can't, I really I, they, I genuinely yeah. They still so this wasn't a matter of the core four eating up so much money that your goaltending or your defense was so poor that you couldn't win. That's not what happened. Like they that wasn't score. the story. Like every other year when they've been talking about trading a core four player, it's been let's trade a core four player to get better on defense or get you know. Some people I've seen some people say you need like a marquee goalie. You can't win with whatever. Um, they could have won. Jack Campbell was good enough for them to win. The blue line was good enough for them to win. They couldn't score. Oh, they my heart. They couldn't score. <laughs> my heart hurts.